D2 Week 1 preview. Obviously, we've done a lot of coverage about the Week 0 slate. But now moving into Week 1, we've got a couple matchups that I definitely do want to highlight heading into the weekend. The first of which, we've got the New Haven Chargers, who are receiving votes in the national poll at number 11, Slippery Rock. And... Uh, Quick notes on both these teams for those of you maybe not as familiar. Slippery Rock, they won their first 10 games of the season in 2023, finished the year 12-2, and and then won the PSAC West title, also made it to the playoffs for the fifth straight year. They made it to the quarterfinals in the playoffs for the third time in the last five years. That is incredible. And... Um, then on the New Haven side of things in 2023, 8-3 overall, still a very respectable record. They did end up winning their conference, the Northeast 10. That conference title, they put together a 6-1 and one record in conference play. Also reached the playoffs for the third straight season for the Chargers. And then uh, they lost in the opening round 52-44 at uh, University of Charleston. So um, a lot of success from both these squads. And... Right off the rip, like Slippery Rock is the heavy favorite in this one. I think I would be, I, I would be lying to you if I said I think New Haven's going to win this game. It doesn't mean I don't think it's going to be a competitive game. Uh, Slippery Rock is definitely the favorite. They have had 14 straight season opening wins, and they've not lost a home opener since the year 2005. That's almost 20 years ago. That's incredible. Also going in their favor, Slippery Rock has 17 starters returning. But out of the couple, not four of them were starting O linemen, all of which had earned all PSAC honors for the Rock down there. So most of your starters are coming back, but one position apparently was absolutely decimated to graduation or just losing those guys. So that's definitely going to be an interesting spot for them. The other big piece they lost last year, we'll talk about Kyle Sheets here uh, in, in a second, but the wide receiver tandem, that duo, Kyle Sheets, Cohen Russell, they were the only duo of wide receivers um, in uh, D2 football last year, to, I believe, to have over, I think it was 1,100 yards apiece. And Kyle Sheets, who just spent his summer with the Kansas City Chiefs, this dude is an absolute Dog. These are some of the highlights last year from Sheets this time with The Rock. And uh, another big piece, the guy throwing him the ball, Brayden Long, he's back under center. 3,800 yards, 35 touchdowns, only six interceptions in 2023. You see him right there, number 18, throwing absolute dots to that massive target, Kyle Sheets, down the field. Now, missing Kyle Sheets, that's going to be a huge part of their offense, no doubt. Him and Cone Russell combined for a lot of big-time pieces. But... They do bring in, excuse me, some pretty talented transfers in the offensive skill positions. The first of which, Idris Lawrence. He's a running back from Notre Dame, Ohio. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about that, obviously, for those of you that are semi-tapped in with the D2 football or small school football world, you know that Notre Dame, Ohio, actually, unfortunately, closed its doors. The school itself uh, no longer has any students. Uh, here's some of his clips from the last season. And sorry about the resolution on these, but it's all I could get off the YouTube. Anyways, over 3,000 rushing yards in this guy's career. He's 5'10", 190 pounds. He was an All-American last year for the Falcons. And that Notre Dame football team was a really solid squad. So Idris Lawrence is going to be a big-time pickup for this Slippery Rock offense. You also bring in Rashawn Harvey, the wide receiver from West Liberty. He led the team in receiving yards there. Seems like there would be a naturally kind of a hole and a role for him to fill on this Slippery Rock offense coming at the wide receiver positions, so there's going to be opportunities available for those offensive skill guys. So definitely smart. It looks like Slippery Rock has gone out of their way to their due diligence, excuse me, to fill in some of those holes. They also have brought in, I do believe, multiple offensive linemen from the transfer portal that will be competing for that uh, those couple of vacancies up front. We talked about it, man. Four offensive linemen from your starting five last year, no longer with the squad. That's going to be a tough thing to overcome. I'm still taking Slippery Rock by two scores in this one at least. Uh, I think the offense is just going to – it will be more than enough. Their defense, we don't talk about enough on this show, but they do just fine for themselves on the other side of the ball as well. Now, moving over. Number 24, Angelo State at Emporia State, who also is receiving votes – in the national poll. Emporia, they're coming off a 30-14 to win versus Ashburn. And Angelo State is coming off a 21-7 to win over Fort Hayes State. Angelo State, a little bit of a uh, quote-unquote probably down year for the, uh, for the Rams last year. And uh, you look at their record. 
Seven and three, which again, quote, that's why I said quote unquote down year because this team has been one that we've come to expect a lot of success out of. Their losses last year all to really respectable opponents. Colorado School of Mines, Central Washington, a, a big time playoff team, UT Permian Basin, all of these two, uh, almost all of them, one score losses. So expect them to be back, but uh, not getting off on the right foot. This year, like I said, versus Fort Hayes State, they dropped that one seven to twenty-one on the road to a Fort Hayes State team that is, you know, for being honest, on the bottom third of the MIAA when it all comes, you know, when it all shakes out. Um, Angelo State-wise, they had no success uh, really on offense, but passing the ball, especially uh, Caden Smith, their starter, he was nine for thirteen, he was efficient, but only had seventy-five yards and uh, no touchdowns on the day. Braden Fuller also took some snaps under center for them, was eight for eleven for forty-eight yards. Just not seeing a whole lot of production out of the air right now for Angelo State, and I think their calling card for the last couple of years, when it comes to the Rams, has been their defensive secondary. They've had one of the best pass defenses in the country, statistically speaking, and. Early indications show maybe that's not the case anymore. Jack Dawson from Fort Hayes State, he had 270 yards and two touchdowns against them through the air. Did have an interception, so they got a takeaway. They generated one there, but it it looks like the calling card for Angelo State might not be as potent, potentially, as it once was. Uh, Emporia, on the other hand, really did not have uh, too many problems offensively, especially when it comes through the air. Gunnar Gundy, which... He's coming over from Oklahoma Oklahoma State, excuse me, playing for his father, Mike Gundy. He comes over to Emporia. He's now the signal caller for the Hornets over here. 27 for 41 in his debut, 292 yards and three touchdowns. One interception to go with that. He also rushes 11 times for 100 yards on the ground, and uh, that's a pretty good debut for Mr. Gundy under center. ESU, they go from Braden Gleason, who was a, you know, kind of a Harlan Hill hopeful and someone who made a lot of things happen for the Hornets. Looks like they have potentially the next guy to step up, fill that role under center for them. And I think that's going to be kind of the name of the game. I don't see Angelo State's offense based on just what we've seen so far in uh, in week zero from them. I don't see them able to keep up with the Hornets. And we know they've got a, Hornets have a pretty good track record of, uh, you know, winning some of those shootout type of contests, at least in the last couple of years. But a lot of things could change. A lot of things could change. I'm taking the uh, the Hornets in that one, though. This next game, though, really exciting one. We've got number 25, Bemidji State. The Beavers are at number 13, Minnesota State Mankato, again, playing against the Mavericks. Big-time NSIC matchup. You look at the history of this matchup. We'll kind of look at the preview of the game here as well. And... Mankato took this one last year, 27 24, 24, excuse me. So a very narrow margin of victory. But the Mavericks have actually won the last four in this matchup. They've won the last four. And that uh, that spans, let's see here. If I find the, uh, yep, here we go. For, so from 2018 onward, Bemidji State has not beaten Mankato. And three of those four games have actually been in Bemidji, been at home. Something definitely worth noting, the Beavers, the Mavericks have just had the Beavers number, I suppose. But, looking at this one, Bemidji in Week 0, they took an overtime thriller at home versus Michigan Tech on Thursday. A a semi-sloppy performance from the Bemidji State offense. We knew that Michigan Tech defense was going to be flying around. Now, they did just let up. It was four overtimes, but they let up like 50 points against South Dakota Mines tonight. So I, I'm not really sure what to make of that Michigan Tech game right now for the Beavers. I think we're a little, still a little bit too close to see how everything shakes out. Uh, Bemidji's offense is definitely going to have to take a step up, though. When you look at the box score from that game against Michigan Tech, Sam McGath is uh, starting under center right now for the Beavers. He was 20 for 36 with 195 and two tuds, which is not a terrible stat line, but you watch the game and it just didn't feel like Bemidji had that same explosive firepower as they did maybe a year ago with Brandon All under center. And I'm not going to say you'll be able to replicate that right away. Obviously, there's some other pieces and they got to get some things figured out on the receiving end uh, when it comes to their offense. But it just feels like that explosive, kind of that X factor for the Beavers offense right now is not exactly there. And uh, if you want to beat Mankato, they are, especially on the road at Mankato, you're going to have to do a lot better than that offensively. I think that's kind of the biggest takeaway for me. Looking at the Mavericks, though, their home, not home opener, but their opener to the season this year down in Northwest Missouri State, that game was ridiculous. And they look really good. They, they just look really 
really solid right now. They beat them 36-22 on the road. That was the 12th consecutive season the Mavericks have won their season opener. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a really good start for them. I don't really know what else to uh, what else to say for you. Hayden uh, Ecker now, the quarterback, is a senior. He's got some good game experience under his belt and some big-time uh, big games, big-time moments. So he's got a little bit more poise maybe than we're used to. The defensive line and defensive kind of that front seven for uh, Mankato really stepped up, and they're going to win against Northwest. I, I feel like they're going to have a... Not an easy time. I feel like they're going to be able, though, to shut down and minimize the Bemidji offense. I think I would take Mankato by like 10 points in this one, especially at home. And if Bemidji can't slow them down, I don't think Bemidji's offense can keep up. I would probably take Mankato by two, maybe even three scores at home. But, again, two nationally ranked opponents. You would like to imagine the score does not get that out of hand. Finally, let's go to the one that we will talk about right after this piece with uh, Tristan X-Line. Number 21, UTPB at CSU Pueblo, who is currently receiving votes in the national poll. I would bet a lot that after this week, they're going to be in that top 25. Uh, But Texas Permian Basin, coming off a Lone Star Conference Championship last year, they beat the brakes off of Western New Mexico last week, 41-3 at home. And CSU Pueblo... They did the same thing to South Dakota Mines on the road, 35-6 to over a hard rocker team that we're finding out might have actually not been that bad. CSU Pueblo might just be very good at football. When you look at the box score for this one, and I'm going to talk about it with Tristan here shortly, but what you'll notice is that through the air, this CSU Pueblo team is getting things done, and they've got a receiving core that uh, is shaping up to potentially be one of the most dangerous in the RMAC. Looking at the box score from their last outing, Devin Larson under center at quarterback for Pueblo, 30 for 45, 500 yards and five touchdowns with no interceptions. Then you go to the receivers. Reggie Retzlaff is a name that we've been familiar with. Anyone who knows our back or D2 football probably knows of him. But then about how about Taylor Toshes? I Hopefully I'm saying that one correctly. 11 catches of his own for 151 in the tud. Reggie had 11 for 241 in three tuds. You're talking about two wide receivers that combined for 400 yards and four touchdowns. That is almost unheard of. So we'll talk about that with Tristan CL. UTPB thinks they can match up against that because UTPB, we know their offense is going to come out and play ball. They did it all last year. feels like they're picking up right where they left off in 2024. We know they can keep up when it comes to a shootout. Can their defense keep them in the game? That's the question mark, especially because they're going on the road. This is at CSU Pueblo. Just judging off week one performances and what we know about each of these squads, I'm giving Pueblo like a a five, six point advantage here, probably a one score type advantage. I would take the Thunderwolves here, especially at home. The home opener, red out game there for the Thunderwolves. Feels like that's going to be a really, really solid environment. Other game notes, though. Um, looking through the facts here. I'm trying to think if we got anything uh, anything big. The first matchup in program history between these two squads, which is pretty neat. But otherwise, I mean, that those are kind of the big notes, at least what I'm expecting 